Hallo fellow board gamers, my name is Marcel, you know me probably as your Herr der Spiele, which is German for Lord of the Board Games. And I do have a very special interview guest. And if you follow my channel, you know I don't do the interview videos often, but I do them for guys I like and for projects I really love. <laughs> and today I have a very special guest here. Hello, Jason, the designer of Seismic the Board Game. Hey, how's it going? Thanks so much, Marcel, for having me. I cannot tell you how excited my, I am to be here, just uh, being able to talk to, to somebody all, across, all around the world. You got such a crazy audience over there that follows you, and I'm super excited to be able to talk about the game with you. Yeah. For me, it is very important that we get the uh, opportunity to talk because we wrote, we are Discord, because yes. I'm a backer of your campaign, of course. Yes, <laughs> And um, <laughs> thank you. I am so happy I came across your project because if I wouldn't support it now, I probably would be very sad in the end. We will talk <laughs> about that, of course. And, of course. And then I ask you, would you have the time? Because it's very important now, the campaign is not running very long. Um, from now on, it's a, approximately a week. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, that's right. And your project is a very special one. But before we talk about that, Jason, you can tell us, the audience, who are you? Just how much <laughs> do you want to tell about you? Well, uh, my name is Jason Blake. I am uh, the publisher of Star Reach Games. My first game is Seismic. Um, I uh, live over in the U.S. I actually live in Texas. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, I'm married. I've got two twins, uh, a boy and a girl that are 13 years old. And um, I play board games all the time. I have a personal collection of just under a thousand games. Wow. So yeah, whole it's like just uh, a crazy number of games, and that's that didn't even count the number of, I've sold over time. But um, super fun. I this is not my day job. I I do actually have a day job. I work in uh, IT, IT and marketing for uh, a robotics company. So I have a really good time with that. And uh, of course, in my spare time, I, I'm working on the seismic, trying to bring it to market. Been doing this a long time. So <laughs> wow, that's crazy! Thousand, a thousand board games. So <laughs> I can go to my wife and say, "Oh, I'm I'm not a crazy guy." Uh, <laughs> talk to Jason. Yeah? He's, he's that's right. Worse than me. Yeah? You see, yeah. here is one of my shelves and there is another room and she always says, I am crazy to hell. Uh, <laughs> I do work as a teacher. Yeah, I don't know if we talked oh, about eight. that. Uh, we have three children and probably the same as you. I do spend nearly every evening playing board games. Yeah, And <laughs> yes. it, it is <laughs> it was so funny when we talked about our appointment today. I mm -hmm. said, oh, take your time <laughs> after your work because I have a board game evening here on Friday. Yeah? And <laughs> yeah. so it's it's um, 1 30 a.m. now because I so have to you play. play tonight. Tell, tell us what you played tonight. Yeah, uh, we, d we did play Gloomhaven. Yeah? Oh, we, wow. <laughs> we played Gloomhaven. It's I don't watched it up, but probably 130 games of Gloomhaven up to now. Holy I, cow. Res I restarted the game twice. But now I have a, a group which works very nicely together. And we did play in this constellation. I think it's 60, 65 plays. And we are almost finished with the game. And Frosthaven is waiting. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I have Frosthaven sitting on my shelf. I have not even started organizing it yet. It's a, it's amazing. Yeah. I, uh, I've played Gloomhaven quite a bit, but uh, nowhere near to your level. So yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, this is I do play nearly every every evening, every every free minute. Of course, I, I do some sports and I play with the children in the spare time. Sure. Yeah, but but board games is my is my passion. Probably <laughs> like same like for yours. me. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, and speaking about passion, I came across your project by browsing. We are GameFound and. Um, it is on GameFound. I will definitely put the link in the video description. And now I think it is the time, the right time to, to go into detail. We will talk about your project. Yeah, what is Seismic? Yeah, which genre it is, uh, the mechanics, and then of course, what makes it special? Yes. So uh, yeah, so Seismic is, uh, I wanted to create kind of a cinematic experience, a very thematic experience. I had just gotten through playing Nemesis and uh, from Awakened Realms. 
And Nemesis created such a really thematic experience for me that I didn't see that in any other games around that same time. Yeah. You've got your, your typical dungeon crawlers, you've got things like that. But, you know, the idea behind Seismic that I came up with was uh, the idea is we've all left Earth and we've gotten to a new planet and uh, we've terraformed the planet but we've actually over terraformed the planet. And you see here, our newly terraformed planet is being torn apart. So what happened is we, uh, we've over terraformed the planet and the planet board is actually suffering fracture events. Mm -hmm. And the fracture events are, are actually the planet's surface crumbling and falling apart. And throughout the game, your units are starting to actually fall into the planet, but your units are there to do uh, various jobs so I came from a background where I played a lot of RTS games, like back in the old days, like Supreme Commander, Total Annihilation, things like that. And so in this, I wanted to have an objective instead of points and scores that seem kind of arbitrary. So the whole point of the game, if you'll see right here, you're trying to take mm -hmm. this scaffolding and you're trying to build a full colony ship uh, over on the left-hand side here. And as you're, as you're going throughout the game, you have to grab the blueprints for each module of the ship. And you don't have to build it in any order, but the blueprints are known by each individual player. And so you have to go and fight with that player. You have to capture their units and then trade those units back as a hostage negotiation. You have to trade them back for the blueprint. And uh, when you gain that blueprint, now you know how to build that particular module. Yeah. And so that's the whole point of the game is to build a massive colony ship and the first one to do it and evacuate all their units is the winner. They, if they launch successfully, the force of the engines from that ship destroy the rest of the planet. And so you'll see down here, there's all kinds of various things that you do throughout the game. Uh, and we can go over kind of each one of those yeah. and talk about uh, talk about those in length. We, but that's kind of a, a you know everything in a nutshell. So yeah. but of course we will talk about mechanics and we will definitely talk about the awesome table presents. <laughs> I think this one is table presents par excellence. But what really hit me first is what you explained a few minutes ago is theme and the goal. Yeah. Yes. I, I always have problems with games that are very cool to play, that have awesome link mechanics, but in the end, it's all about victory points, doom right. points or tainted points. Call them however you want, but yep. it always feels too much mechanic. But building yes. a starship and being the first to really launch, leave the planet, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's really, really great because For me, I always say theme is king, yeah? Yes. Theme is king. If you feel the theme, yeah? If if you have the tension on the board that you have to leave the planet because it collapses and everything you have to do is building that starship and not just being the one who have more than 100 victory points, that's yes. really thematic. And this is <laughs> one of the aspects which I really like of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's my favorite thing about the game is, yeah. you know, the idea that I, I there's plenty of games I love. I love Eclipse. Eclipse is one of my favorites. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, it just feels arbitrary. It's like just whoever has the most points at the end wins. And it's just a it just feels so, so strange to say, oh, I'm the ruler of the galaxy because I got one more point than you. So in this, you know. I read a book years ago, and I talk about this often. I read a book about, not by Stephen King, but about how Stephen King writes. Yeah. And what he does is he he writes, he, he comes up with a, a problem or an idea, and then he takes all these characters that he's already created elsewhere, and he drops them in and lets the story tell itself. He thinks that, he, he sees himself as a narrator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I kind of did the same thing mm -hmm. in... in um, how a lot of other designers, board game designers, they start with mechanics. They have a, a particular mechanic that they like or that they they really work, like to work with. And, you know, they say, oh, I'm going to make a worker placement game or I'm going to make a deck builder. I went the opposite. I said, I want to make a game where you, where you have a planet that's falling apart and you want to launch a ship off of. How can I use that? How can I make mechanics work for me? Hmm. And so I completely worked reverse. In fact, there's mechanics inside of seismic that you will never see in another game yeah. because it wouldn't make sense 
And so, um, so yeah, that's the, you know, that's how I started is everything will feel very, very thematic. You'll be calling out units by name. You'll be calling out yeah. like fracture events, things like that, instead of just saying, oh, I need to move this cube from here to here, you know, something like that. <laughs> so, and, and here you just get what we players want, because if you translate it to a television uh, series or a movie, a blockbuster, they always say, show, don't tell. That's right. It's, it's always bad if you tell the audience what happened in the background. Just show it to them. This is, Absolutely. of course, we could talk about Acolyte and what Disney does worse. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. a, a good movie, a good movie shows what we want to experience. And I think this is the right approach for a board game as well. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Awesome. Yes. Um, I think it's, it's, Probably the best if we now talk about what's special, what's unique. Where's the unique selling points of your board game? So let's talk about some of the things that I, I think are really unique about it. And again, yeah. you know, unique is a is a word that gets thrown around a lot in board games, yeah. and you know, particularly in crowdfunding. And 90% percent of the time, you know, marketing, it's, it's marketing, yeah. yeah, it's it's nonsense. But when I say there are really, truly unique things about Seismic, I really do mean it, and I'm, I'm very passionate about it. One of the things here that you see on screen is, uh, of course, all of the, the different asymmetrical factions. And, you know, and obviously, you know, almost every game for the last, like, 10 or 15 years now, everybody has an asymmetrical, you know, way. But let me tell you what is different about Seismic. Same, same kind of idea that I took for the game mechanics I did for the actual faction uh, abilities. I started with the, the person and their profession, and I said, okay, how would they in their profession go about you know, being able to build a ship? And so each and every one of the factions has an ability that is, or has four, up to three to four abilities that is very, very specific to how they would operate. So for example, this businessman, he doesn't actually go out and fight he actually buys, he tries to gain as much crystal ore as he can to buy the blueprints from other players. The, um, but the, it's the, the total opposite right here, this uh, character named Holifer Sphere, uh, Sphere, she's a mob boss. She only goes out and fights and she actually captures prisoners beyond the prisoners that she needs. And she actually trades prisoners to other people. And she's basically like a hired hitman, like a mercenary. So. If you truly play your character to their strengths, it's going to be not only to your benefit to win the game, but it's also going to be a very thematic experience. And so there's 18 different factions in the game, and they all play so wildly different. And it's not just, oh, gee, here's a mechanic in the game that I'm going to exploit. You know, it's much, much more thematic and deep than that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things, um, you know, that uh, I think makes the game extremely unique. The uh, some of the other things, let's jump into, you know, of course, replayability. I mean, the uh, the number of things that happen throughout a game of seismic, the board is falling apart, you know, and the board falls apart completely randomly. You don't know where the board is going to is going to have hexes that go lost. You may lose units constantly. This this game is a meat grinder where you're going to be losing units over and over and over. And, you know, the game allows you to make massive comebacks very quickly so you don't have to worry Uh, about like, oh, I've taken a huge setback and, you know, and I'm, I'm now no longer, you know, no longer in the game. That's not the way seismic works at all. So um, some other some other elements is, uh, you know, of course, we've talked about the thematic elements of it and the asymmetry of the uh, of the different uh, factions. But the, um, the the single goal, a lot of people think, well, how is the game going to play different if I'm always building just the ship? But the idea of how you go about it is really based on how you play your faction, but also on the combos that you can play when you play certain cards, the order in which you play the cards, because the cards tie into your player board and the the kind of bonus action you get is is based on when and how the you know what card you choose to play. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other elements in a game this size, and you can play up to six players in Seismic, mm -hmm. but one of the problems with games this size, of course, typically is downtime. Yeah. Downtime is just, ugh, it's brutal. And I mean, we've all played a game where we're just waiting for our turn. In Seismic, the number of things that are happening at any given moment keep you engaged 
There's cards you can play off of your turn, even wow. when it's not your turn. There's battles that take place that include you that, you know, are going to be resolved when it's not your turn. There are fracture events that happen on other people's turns that may affect your units. You're constantly engaged. You're never sitting around waiting. And uh, then, of course, you know, the, the multi-use cards. Again, multi-use cards is another term thrown around. But in Seismic, every card is, is multi-use to the nth degree. So the discovery cards, for example, uh, you have a uh, you have a die modifier up in the corner, so you can use it during combat. You have the actual main uh, action in the middle that you can use throughout the game as a as another bonus action. And then on the bottom, you have all kinds of resources and other things that you can use and and turn the card in for. Mm -hmm. The um, the relic cards are uh, permanent abilities that you can enhance your faction with, but at the same time, you can also get rid of a relic card and pull one of your command cards back, which is really, really powerful. And then, of course, the espionage cards ask the, the, uh, the question of, what kind of gamer are you? And this is where I think Seismic, a lot of people really like the espionage cards because the red side of the espionage cards are for everybody else's detriment. But the green side is for your only benefit. And so there's a, there's a huge way that people, uh, you can tell what kind of gamer somebody is by the side of the, uh, of the espionage card people choose to use. So um, one of the other things that I think is extremely important to know about Seismic, the board being a circle is um, not just a circle. You can't, you can't turtle back in the corner. Think of the board as an actual true planet, meaning the board is a sphere. When you move off of the edge of the board, you'll see all these little uh, multicolored chevrons. And if you move off the board, let's say you move on that yellow spot uh, right in the middle, if this purple unit moves right off of that yellow space, they can move off the board, around the board, to any other hex with the yellow arrows on the outside. That's from StarCraft. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, StarCraft does something very similar. Yeah. And so uh, movement in the game, there's 127 hexes of movement. And you would think, oh my gosh, how do I ever get anywhere? But every unit has a, a large amount of movement. So at any given, uh, any given time, a unit can just zoom across the board. It's also kind of like scythe and the fact that you can jump into a tunnel and jump out of another tunnel. So, you know, you can go off the edge of the board and go off to anybody else. So everybody is as close to each other as anybody else is. Yeah. And it doesn't feel contrived or arbitrary like a lot of games try to make everybody like, you know, the same distance apart. It really truly is. Um, it feels like you're on a planet and not just a round board. So that's, that's a lot of the elements. There's there's tons of things I could talk here about, like yeah. what makes the game unique. But you know, um, I tried to design the game to solve a lot of the problems that you see in these big troops on a map games, where you know everybody beats up on one player and that player is not having fun. You know, you don't you don't actually ever want to want to go and have a um, a battle with a player that you've already gained the blueprint from, mm. and that means you have to interact with everybody at the table at least once and sometimes twice to be able to achieve what you need from them. But that also means you're sharing that level of, of battle and that level of combat so that, you know, not every, you know, not one player is just being beat up by everybody at the table. So there's no vulturing or dogpiling like you see in a lot of other troops on a map style games. So those are a lot of the things that yeah. I really, uh, really think are important to, uh, to know. Very important. And thank you for that. I can, of course, I can only speak for myself, but I think you hit the point for a lot of players like me with all these Yeah, let's call it selling points. Probably one of them or some of them are unique selling points. I think the thematic integration in the game, as I said, theme is king, is very, very good here. Yeah, the, the destruction of the planet, um, what you do, what you play. Then, of course, the high asymmetry of the factions. You, you talked about that is very important for me because this is replayability, of course. I want of to, course. yeah, I want to experience how the faction work. We will talk about the, uh, the gameplay soon. Yeah, the, the yes. hand management, which is one of my most loved mechanics. I really adore games where there is low downtime. I like games of Lacerda, these expert Euro games, but oh, I have 
big problems waiting 10 minutes and I forget what I want to do. I'm a reactive player. <laughs> and I, and yeah. I like a Merry Trash, uh, of course. Um, Multi-use cards, awesome. And um, the way we move, like we said, it's StarCraft where you have the back entrance opportunity here at your board as well. And, um, and one thing is very important for me. I like competitive games, confrontative games with high player interaction. And I think here with Seismic, we have a very high interaction. This is very important for me. And if the game tells a story, what what can we expect more that's that's incredible yeah <laughs> i really appreciate it. i feel the same way yeah. i mean that's i i exactly have all the same thoughts that's why i went the yeah. direction i did with it yeah yeah so these selling points definitely trigger me uh, but let's talk about the gameplay now i think the core gameplay which i uh, identified is the you have the player board yeah here you show it the summary yes. board and we have cards and from what I understand, you have the command cards, it's 10. And yes. every time you play a card, you have to discard the other. Can you talk a bit more about the mechanics here? Yes, absolutely. So there's there's uh, 10 command cards. Ah, got it and right. um, so there are six unit cards and four tactic cards within mm -hmm. the command cards. So on your turn, what you're gonna do is you start off on a round and a round is five turns for everybody at the table. You start off on a round and you have all 10 cards in your hand. So what you're gonna do is you're going to pay one card face down. You're going to choose the card out of your hand that you don't think that you are going to be playing within the next five turns. And of course, predicting that is very difficult, <laughs> particularly early on. So you're going to lay one card face down and then you're going to take another card that you actually wanna play and you're gonna play that card face up. So if that card happens to be a unit, the interesting thing also about Seismic, how much it changes from one turn to the next, if it's a unit card, you don't just activate one unit, you activate all of your units. So mm -hmm. for example, um, if you've got 10 soldiers on the board, which is your maximum number of soldiers, you don't move them around like in a lot of games. You don't move them around as a big group. A hex can only hold three units. And so mm -hmm. what you're going to do is you're going to move all of your soldiers, each one independently, however you choose. They don't have to move as groups. They don't have to move as a, as a troop. You don't have to do anything like that. Each one can move independently and activate independently when you play your soldier card, for example. And this applies to all of the units. So when you go through, you're gonna play the card from top to bottom, and then at the very bottom of the card, you have three symbols. Mm -hmm. One of those symbols is always going to be gray, and gray is kind of a universal uh, list of choices of bonus actions that you always have available. Mm -hmm. But the other two symbols are gonna give you the option to choose one of the other two bonus actions in that column. So you have five columns going across on your player board and you start off and you play from left to right. Mm -hmm. So when you burn that card and you play that card in that first column, for example, in the, uh, in the diagram here, this player has the blue or green action as well as the gray action to choose from. So they can choose the blue action as their bonus action after they've moved and, and activated all their soldiers. They could also choose green or they can always default back to one of the gray options. So these also, uh, these uh, red, blue, uh, orange, green, and purple going all the way across, not only are these 25 different actions, but wow. they get gradually more powerful as you get to the end on command uh, uh, 005, command five space. So when you're choosing, uh, and the, the number of icons of a color uh, you only have two blue icons, for example, in the entire four cards. And that applies to all the different colors. So what happens is early on, a lot of players who start playing the game, they just kind of say, okay, well, I want to do this one. I'm going to play this card and I'm going to take this particular bonus action. Mm -hmm. But what happens is as you go across, you go, oh no, I really want to take this blue action in, in command slot four, but I've already wasted my, my blue maybe face down somewhere. My other blue is face up and in command slot one. What do, you know? Now I'm going to miss out on this super powerful ability. So the choices that you're making uh, as you're going across, you know, when you get to the to the second spot, you've got eight cards. You get to the third spot, you have six cards. And of course, as you get down to the end, 
the very last slot, you only have the two cards left in your hand, mm. and you've played four, you know, four turns all around the table, and now you've got these two cards, and you don't know whether you made a good choice or not. And so once you've gone through all of 10 cards, now you get to pull them all back into your hand when the new round starts. And that's that's the key. Yeah, and that's very important for me because we talked about um, living a story or experience a story, um, and I think every decision has consequences. And that's, <laughs> yes. that's so important. When we were talking about Nemesis earlier on, here probably it's the same. You do play a card and the card you play has a lot of consequences. And here comes again, theme is king. This is what I expect from a board game. I want to feel the tension. I want to experience a story. And here comes one thing we did not talk about, the fracture events. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. The fracture <laughs> event is what makes Seismic special, I think. Can you talk yes. a bit about them? So during the game, there is a uh, there's a, a board, a, a small sideboard over to the side, and it's called the Trimmer Activity Meter. Yeah. And the way I generally describe it to people is it's basically the same as like a seismograph. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is is measuring earthquakes and they're getting, you know, they're trying to predict an earthquake, mm -hmm. this is the, the same exact way that this works. But... As you start off, there's a there's a certain spot that you start based on player count, but there's a stack of tokens. And as you are playing the game, and in fact, let's move up here and I'll show you some of the icons, certain cards include trimmers. And when you play these cards, you are causing a massive trimmer across the whole planet's surface. Mm -hmm. And so things like, for example, the big the big mechs, the big power mechs, anytime you activate a power mech, When it jumps and then lands on the surface, it causes the entire planet to shake, and it, it moves the trimmer tracker one step forward. And this continues either throughout combat or based on cards you play. So you're moving a stack of tokens, and when you reach the fracture uh, spot at the end of the track, then you're going to pull a token out of the bag. And the token is double-sided. One side is going to match one of the six terrains on the board. And the other side is going to match which row of hexes, one through six, uh, meaning one is uh, one single hex. But if you pull the six for that terrain, it could knock out all six hexes on the back side. And so there are massive fracture events. There are very small fracture events. But anything on those hexes, and that could be anything from a colony where there's colonists that, that are habitats that give you influence on the planet. It could be your own units. It could even be your colony ship. If those hexes are what's affected, certain units can survive and they can move if they have a place to do so. But otherwise, all of your units can fall into the planet and they, they die along with all the colonists and everything else. And this is happening throughout the game. Mm. And so the crazy thing about it is, um, and again, this is a mechanic that you may not see almost ever, I knew that the planet needed to uh, accelerate. The whole point of playing the game is yet, you know, the planet's going to start falling apart more and more and more. When you reset the fracture board, you move that stack of tokens back to its original starting spot, but you leave a token and then you take the rest of the stack and you move it one step forward. Hmm. And so now as you move and you continue uh, having trimmer events, the fractures happen more and more frequently until the all of these spaces are filled up. And then every time you see this symbol, now you're drawing a, a fracture token. And so the longer you play the game, mm. the more the planet disintegrates and the more units you're going to lose and the more attrition overall all players experience. <laughs> okay. This is definitely a thing I really like, definitely, because it's, again, really thematic. But of course, this could be something where people who want to have complete control over their actions <laughs> and control over what is happening on the board, this could be a thing that one or the other will not like. Or It, it is very true. It yeah. is very true. And, you know, the thing is, is there's um, there is no real control. Chess players, How, for example. Chess players. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Hardcore Euro players, yeah. the, the Vitala Serta guys, you know. Yeah. These are not going to be. Um, this is going to be something that they will definitely frown upon. But let me tell you. Let me tell you what I do um, have a, a, after thousands of play tests, particularly at conventions. When you when you describe it, a lot of people immediately do have a reaction of like, oh, I, I don't want this. I don't want my units to go away. Mm -hmm. The the first thing I like to tell people is that any attrition you experience 
is uh, is going to be easy to bounce back from. Mm. The second thing is, is even though you don't have control over where it's going to happen, the difference is, is that many of your units, including your colony ship, have the ability for, uh, for something called early warning. And early warning allows you to save those units. Mm. And those attributes can actually carry over if you have friendly units in the same hex as well as a unit that has that attribute, they all get to, you know, because thematically it makes sense, right? If you've got a minor unit who knows that the planet's about to, to crack and there's several soldiers guarding him, he's not gonna leave his soldiers behind. He's gonna be like, hey guys, the, 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 the whole floor is about to fall out from under us, let's move. And he's gonna take his friends with him. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of mitigation yeah. that the game offers cool. to keep you from just being able to, yeah. to constantly lose units. Yeah. Okay, and of course I did watch <laughs> nearly every single video I could find, playthroughs <laughs> and previews and so on. And if you scroll a bit down to mm -hmm. see component list or probably, oh, yes. yeah, uh, the table presents, we talked about that in the beginning, oh, is yes. incredible. It's a huge <laughs> board, it's the hex tile, it's such, a, you need a big table and you see all these miniatures. So table presents is incredible. And sometimes I think, how can you even produce such a thing? <laughs> and here we probably come to rewards. Um, I spent some time, a lot of time with the campaign And yeah, this is this is the one I am supporting. But probably <laughs> can you tell the audience a bit about um, your thoughts about what you offer and probably what you there was this famous update seven, um, but not everybody read the update. Um, sure. Yeah. What would you suggest people to uh, yeah to take? <laughs> yeah. So, so clearly, yeah. There's a there's been several updates I've put a out. Probably um, guide or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, there's yeah there's been lots of updates I put out, and yeah. so um, update number six, I believe, I talked very um, extensively about why. I uh, am recommending the designer's vision. So, uh, update seven uh, kind of doubled down on that and offered even more information about why I believe that the, the designer's vision yeah. is the way to go. But so the problem is, is I'm an independent publisher and yeah. you have to think about what does it take to produce a game of this magnitude? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is literally a game that would be competing with the Awakened Realms yeah. or the CMONs of the board gaming industry. And I'm trying to do this independently, which is utterly insane. So I had a very, very high funding goal, which again is also very rare in the crowdfunding yeah. world. Um, I needed uh, $160,000 US to uh, make the game. And uh, that was the bare minimum to actually produce the game mm. to make a thousand copies. So what I'm what I'm recommending to most people, and again, there's, there's, a, there's a variety of things. If I go back up at the uh, pledges at a glance, yeah, please. right here, We talk about, uh, I, I, I kind of explain all the pledges out. The, the core experience, the core edition, is just the competitive experience at four players. Mm. It also, though, only limits you to eight factions, mm. and you don't get <laughs> the espionage cards and a variety of other things. And the only way that I can offer that is uh, to make it as, as inexpensive as I have is to trim out so many of these components. Mm. Um, it obviously makes the box smaller, the shipping mm. lighter weight, But, you know, for the money that, you know, I'm trying to save, I just I, I didn't know if this was a good a good example or not. And a lot of people have clearly chosen not to back it. It's a, it's only got, I think, right now, like 20 something uh, people backing it. So it's really just not ideal. The expanded edition is even less really, I think, even less desirable uh, because it show, it gives you literally everything that the game offers except for the uh, habitats, which is the white buildings and the control flags that sit on them along with the mountains. Now, in a lot of crowdfunding campaigns, things like, you know, 3D mountains, it's just, you know, they always do this just to kind of, you know, pad their, their crowdfunding uh, uh, totals. That's not the case. In Seismic, uh, the mountains not just show you pathing, how you can get around and move around the, the planet easier, but the buildings and the control flags that you place on the buildings are very, very, very important. If we look down here at, at uh, a couple of these, um, uh, you know, uh, photos here, yeah. the the buildings, these white buildings with the uh, the different control flags on them, 
those are functional. Yeah. The the buildings. Let me let me go. They have to, a purpose. The miniatures yes, have a they, purpose. Yeah. Yes, everything has a purpose in the game, and what that was what I was trying to show people is that in this um, everything in seismic is designed for usability, not just for prettiness. You know, I mean, I love a good table presence, like like you and I were talking about. Yeah. You know, I love a big table presence, but you know, there's no point in just buying miniatures just for the sake of having a bunch of miniatures on the table. So these buildings, for example, the smallest buildings are called camps. These are, are shorter than the other two. They also have one pipe that comes out of the back and that symbolizes that they're only worth one influence, one, yeah. one planetary influence. The second buildings are outposts and these have two pipes coming out of the back. And so you can see from a distance, not only are they taller, but they have the two pipes, so they're two influence. The um, settlements, which are the third size, are even taller, and they have three pipes coming out of the back, mm -hmm. worth three influence. And then you have Colony City, which stands alone, and it has five pipes coming out of the back. So these are not only functional from a distance, you can see across the whole table. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can look across the table and you can see uh, at a glance who has what kind of influence and which ones are targets of opportunity. Yeah. And so they're functional. They're not just, uh, they're not just there to pretty up the game board. Mm. And that's why I, uh, my recommendation of course yeah. is the designer's vision, which, you know, for, for the price that I'm offering, yeah. <laughs> I know it's, you know, everybody has a budget that they have to stay within, but for the price that I'm offering, yeah. if you don't believe that this is one of the best values in crowdfunding yeah. right now, I highly recommend you go read, uh, I believe it's update number six. Yeah. And I go into breaking it out into various pieces. This would be closer to 400 plus dollars if I was somebody like Simon or Awaken Realms. Yeah. And I'm selling the entire thing for $199.99. And again, you know, it's, you know, if, if budget, you know, if budget is important to you and you still want the seismic experience, there are two other pledges for you, yeah. but this really by far is the best value on the internet right now. Okay. And, and now here I come as a crazy super backer, which is <laughs> not a title you want to have. Yeah. That's just not, <laughs> nothing that makes you special. Um, it's, it's a problem when talking to your wife. <laughs> but I think I do have a lot of experience uh, pledging, paying, and and <laughs> and valuating. And so yes. I think definitely the 200 US dollars is a very good price for for the material which comes to your table. And then it's the game is not only material. We talked about the mechanics and the ideas behind that. So I think if you if you would sell that you you were talking about awaken realms or simon they would never sell that for 200 us dollars probably oh, yeah. probably they would say 250 i don't think that i think they oh, yeah. would say 290 which was your um, immortal vision all in they were all yes. gone <laughs> sadly they were all <laughs> gone when i joined yeah yes. but i think if uh, yeah you 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 talked about that this is my opinion the expanded edition is a foul compromise yeah yes you are saving probably 20 euros dollars i don't know but yes. you don't have the complete game so That's is right. a foul compromise and the core edition of course if you are short on money you can take it but i think uh, probably it's 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 hard to produce them you have to sell and pack different parcels i don't know the shipping yes. company yeah for me i don't need to 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 think about that you 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 you, you don't support it or you take the all in the, the vision all in pledge and this is a uh, yeah it's, it's, <laughs> yes, it's a I, fair, yeah. and you know I, I know it sounds like marketing nonsense. No, it is not. It is definitely but, not. But it really is not. Yeah. No. I mean, you know, of course, you know, every campaign always wants you to back the the, the largest, you know, because mm. that's their highest profit margin. But again, if you if you actually uh, are interested in the game and you do take the time to read some of my updates, yeah, the amount of um, the amount of pushback that I got from other publishers and other uh, other companies that said, "Do not do this. Mm. You will not make a dime." I, I knew that. I knew that going in, and I knew that I had to have a high funding goal. Mm. The funding goal mm. is literally there to just yeah. make the game. I will not make any money off of this at yeah. all. And I hope that later with a reprint, I might be able to actually try to recoup some of my some of my actual money I spent out of pocket. But yes, the um, uh, this is a game that is a passion project. Yeah. 
and mm. all of the mm. funds are going to go towards uh, everybody getting the best possible game that I can give them. Yeah, and I definitely uh, um, appreciate this, and I think a lot of backers appreciate your uh, your honesty here. That um, of course we all know there are so many projects. Again, we will not talk bad about Simon. They do ta uh, uh, deliver great work, but the funding goal always with these great big companies, which is probably 40,000 uh, US dollars, uh, sometimes 60,000. Everybody knows you cannot produce something. <laughs> They always cancel that if it's of less course. than 100,000 or something like that. And uh, in the end, people get angry at them. And yes. you were up front. You said yes. it does not make any sense because um, we know that from Essen Spiel and we see all the uh, Chinese uh, producers. Uh, of course, there are these economies of scale. You cannot produce a board game if you sell 200 products, uh, to 200 um, copies, of course. Yes, yeah? of uh, course. I think the bigger ones always say 1,000, 3,000. Yes. 5,000 and it always gets cheaper because they have the they just have to uh, to to install the machines one time and then they produce them yeah and, that's right and I really like that everybody of us knew that from the beginning if we of don't course. get 160,000 the project will not become reality of course you are in the lucky situation that you do not need to earn money with your project it's a passion yes. project um i think you deserve to get some money of it so i i <laughs> keep my fingers crossed that in the last days there will be backers joining yeah so yes. that um yeah you definitely do not have to invest your own money that will be great of course yeah. <laughs> i hope not yeah. i hope not but you know i've i've made it a long way and yeah. I, i have spent more money than i think most people even have an idea <laughs> of course uh, yeah. but you know it's uh but again it's a passion project i've been working on for so long now yeah. i'm just so excited um about getting it in people's hands i just can't i can't wait for everybody to play it and i think when people get it on that table and they talk about it they write about that and they There are some influencers and so they do a video and they show it and probably a playthrough and then there would be a, probably the time to to do a reprint of course now you have the previewers who who uh, show the board game but then um, i think people can probably say oh i want the game and yeah you know yes absolutely yeah for sure do you have do you have a timeline when you want to uh, be ready to deliver so right now the uh, the timeline is actually pretty aggressive. I'm trying to make sure it is in people's hands by August of 2025. Wow. Now again, you know it's a long time, but for an independent project, particularly yeah. of something like this scale, yeah. um, I am mostly ready to go. And the other interesting thing about it is that you know most projects, again, particularly of something of this magnitude. Usually there is a a massive group of people behind it, and they you know anytime you start adding more and more people to a project, it can actually not increase in productivity. And many times it actually decreases. And so the good news is is I'm actually in control of the the graphics, the design, the layout, the um, you know the parts, the approval. Uh, so everything from beginning to end. I'm only waiting on myself. And so I don't like to wait on anything. So therefore, you know, anything that the manufacturer is going to be providing to me, it's going to be an instant response back. I don't have to say, hold on, let me get with my artist. Hold on, let me get with my manager. Hold on, let me let me bring this to the, you know, to the to the head of the department. I don't have to do any of that. I'm I'm all of those things. And yeah. so You know, the, the, the detriment is that I have to do it all. But on the on the flip side, I'm able, I think, to overcome a lot of the deadlines and a lot of that, um, uh, you know, multi-person, you know, chain of, of command. I can bypass all of that. So I can turn right. things around back to the manufacturer very, very quickly. And for us backers, of course, that is a, a very important information. Um, as I already downloaded it and, and read through it, everybody can convince him or herself that the rule book is written yeah you can you <laughs> yes. can you can read the rules there is nothing you have to think about and produce the game itself works there yes. is also a tts version i think yes um, so you can try it out yourself um, and this is because you can uh, as soon as you have the funds i think you go and uh, have your negotiations with the uh, with the companies that produce the game and so uh, yeah Next year, 
probably before Essen Spiel, our latest at, at winter holidays, we have our games, and that will be awesome. Ah, that's what my hope is. I mean, you know, the world is, is a crazy place yeah. these days, but I feel very confident that I can I can definitely get there. I mean, most of the game, I don't have any development time, which is obviously another biggie. So really, it's going to be almost as soon as I get funding yeah. straight out of GameFound, I can go straight, sign my contract with the manufacturer, and immediately start issuing files to them. Yeah. And so I can have uh, the box... The, you know, some of the what they call the white box, which is where yeah. they're actually die cutting everything. They can get that back to me in a very short period of time. Mm. And they told me it's about five months for all the miniatures wow. to be uh, created and done, you know, meaning like the molds and all that. And then, of course, injecting the miniatures is is no time. You know, that's the mass produ production after the fact. So I'm hoping that um, by the time end of year, end of this year, I should have what I consider all of the manufacturing files to them. So I would love for them to be um, giving me a, uh, a, a manufactured prototype before Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. And then during Chinese New Year, I can evaluate it, make any minor last minute changes. And I'm hoping that as soon as Chinese New Year ends, I would like to have manufacturing started and then, um, say, by May or June, shipments should be starting to go out to all the different countries, and the distribu uh, distributors at that point should be delivering them by uh, mid to late summer. And mm. so that's my, awesome. that's my timeline. I feel really good about it. So we have a fresh setting. We have uh, nicely linked mechanics. We have an awesome table presents. And not to forget, we have a real crowdfunding project, which would never become reality without the backers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Jason, I am so happy I came across the project and that you took your time to answer all my questions here. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Oh, I, I cannot thank you enough for having me. I just, uh, I love the idea of knowing that a game that I literally created in my living room or my dining room is going to see people all over the world, you know, get the same kind of entertainment out of it that I did, I hope. And I just, I cannot wait to see people talking about it, the videos about it, all of those things. I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to come on and talk with you about it and introduce it to an even bigger audience. Thank you so much. And everybody of you? Outside there watching, I included the GameFound link in my video description. Just click on it, press it. It's just seven days to go from now on, probably a five to six when the video is online. Don't miss that awesome product project because it could be gone when you do wait too long. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> thank you so much, Marcel. Again, thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Have a nice time then. Bye. Bye-bye.